17 or 18. <laughs> We met 17 or 18 years ago in a, a little dusty dirt floored restaurant uh, in a remote area of central Laos called Nekai. And we met within view of the Salaz range in the Annamite mountains. Um, I was then advisor to a large protected area nearby and Akju had just recently finished her master's degree in Australia in GIS informa uh, graphical information systems. And she was working for the Wildlife Conservation Society in Laos and Vientiane. And our organization had contracted them to help us with some wildlife monitoring. So that's how we met. Over the ensuing years, I, I learned what a remarkable person she is. Um, amongst her many achievements and accomplishments are um, yoga teacher, belly dancer, rock and roll singer. She's like very famous in Vientiane as a rock and roll singer. Uh, single mom of an adopted daughter. And along the way, she went on to get her PhD at Oxford um, in a study of wild felids like clouded leopard and their inter interaction with canids like the Asiatic wild dog. Um, and we're going to hear about her research today. Um, I might note she is the only Lao person ever to get a degree from Cambridge or Oxford. She's now director of conservation for the WWF uh, Laos program. I, yeah, World Wildlife Fund Laos program. And as you're going to see, she's not just a compassionate conservationist and a deeply knowledgeable one. She's just an extraordinary person. And so it's really my pleasure and honor to introduce Akchu and hand it over to you. Thank you, everyone. Hi. Good morning. Good evening. Good afternoon to everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yep, all clear. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yep, looks good. Just bear with me one second. I'm trying to rearrange. Um, okay, so um, thank you for uh, attending today. Um, I'm excited, but also nervous because I'm uh, excited to uh, to meet all of you, and excited that I would uh, that I have this opportunity to uh, tell you a little bit about um, what I've been doing and and some of the. Uh, story of my journey. So, um, yeah, so the, the title of my talk today is um, Into the Run of the Clouded Networks. Um, this is uh, the talk, the kind of talk that won't, probably won't go into the um, uh, technical details very much because of some uh, general audience. But if you feel like you would like to know more, um, you can shoot me some questions at the end or feel free to email me. So before I get into uh, talking about this cute furry um, animal, um, I would like to tell you a little bit about my um, journey going into deep into the forest and coming up to be here, right in front of you. So, one second, I'm having some technical difficulty here. So I grew up in this large piece of a, it, well, it's, it's, to me, when I was younger, it was a large piece of property where my family shared, um, it, there are a few families living in the compound and the, the property is surrounded by uh, fruit trees, luscious uh, vegetation, uh, sorry, vegetable gardens, chicken shade, 
pig pens. This is the um, the char characters that are defining the um, the properties that I grew up with. I grew up in, sorry. So this is from the small seed when I was very young. So this is how I spent my life um, during that period. This was in Savannake, which is the south of uh, the capital city of Laos. Um, if you drive, it takes about six hours to get there. And um, so because of this surrounding, so nature is not very far away from back in the day. I mean, the, the development that it was still a dirt road in this um, district of the uh, Savannah Cape province. So nature was just uh, a few steps from the fence. So um, the best toys that I had, or my siblings had were, all from nature. So if, let's say I wanted to play cooking, I had, uh, I have some taro leaves. Uh, it's not always very, I mean, for some people, they get allergic to it. My mom was not always very happy for me to play with it, but you know, that was the best option for us to, to, to reach into. And I have, uh, you know, some fruits that's, uh, the berries that we were told that we shouldn't put in our mouths, but we can play with it uh, to make a pretentious drinks, but we don't really drink. We just threw it away. And we have some flowers, like the yellow one, we pretend it to, if we slice it up, then it looks like uh, some egg, shredded eggs, and then the red flowers, we pretended it to be the meat for our cooking. So, and um, when there is a season of this, uh, I'm not sure it, uh, how many of you know of uh, these trees, uh, the, uh, it's called sapodilla um, tree, the fruit trees. I think the name, it came from uh, Mexico. I think it's native to Mexico, but then we have it also in Asia. So these trees, uh, we have, we have, there was one of these in um, in the back of our house. And my favorite things to do was to climb up this chicken shed uh, up to the metal, the broken metal roof, and just to hang up there to just get the fruits that was hanging, uh, the branches was branching over the roof and then just to pick the fruits. So this is like our candy shops, that's how we, <laughs> We snacks. And one day, um, I, so it, it all started with my um, spontaneous visit to, um, so I, I'm just skipping all of this um, journeys in between. I grew up, I went to study, came back to Laos and I started teaching at the University of Laos as a GIS. Uh, I was teaching the GIS uh, int Introduction to Geographic Information System. And um, at the time, just coincidentally, I, I was told that I should be stepping in just to come into this office. So it all started with me spontaneously visited WCS Lao programs. So I was at the time, I was eager to explore the uh, possibility of working with the um, with the organization for I don't know what 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 it was going to be maybe just for the weekend, but then um, little did I know that this visit would ignite a deep rooted passion of uh, conservation within me, um, and completely change the course of my journey. So. If you ask me when my passion to nature began or the, my love of nature began, I think it was, um, for me, I was just, like I said, my, my, my environment, the surroundings kind of in, influenced me automatically. I was born in it. I was 
just uh, living, I was surrounded by, by, by the nature. So this is a, this is a case for a lot of Lao people um, at my, during my generation and those who live in rural areas. So being able to join the organization made me understand um, a lot of things. So I met um, by the, uh, uh, biologists and uh, some uh, experts in their fields, uh, that including the uh, wildlife experts and uh, protected area management experts that have uh, influenced me and really uh, inspired me to be more than just sitting behind the computer. And so that's how my journey began. So now, as I, 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 I embarked on my journey, um, I found myself also curious about a lot of things in, in nature, but, but then the main thing, uh, part of the main interest that I had as I embarked on this journey was uh, my interest um, about the clouded leopards and its relatives. So when I say its relatives, I mean, or are the wildcats and the, the related prey, the prey of the species. So why, uh, you may be um, interested in un understanding why I'm all of a sudden interested in, in clouded leopards. I mean, apart from um, being in the environment where enabled, uh, enabling me to to get more information and and um, in the place where things allow me to move forward in in the field, I find this uh, species quite fascinating, uh, which um, I'm going to tell you a little bit more in terms of their characteristic their. Um, the the facts that maybe some of you may know, some of you might not know. So, having said that, let's meet the clouded leopards. So, the clouded leopards. Um, this species is known to be elusive, shy. In other words, um, the name came from the distinctive uh, markings um, on its coat, which is like the fur. Um, these markings are, let me just zoom in a little bit. So these markings are a pale gray brow color. Um, and then you have uh, the dark edge, um, which when you look at it, kind of use human imagination comparing to what you see in your day-to-day uh, -day life. This looks a little bit like plow. Uh, so it's the shape, it's plow-like blotches, right? So this is where the name came from, um, clouded leopard. So, so Clouded leopards is not your average house cat. So it's about four to five times larger. So the size, um, it's about half a meter high. high. Um, it's about the size of a large dog, if you may put it. And the, the weight is um, about uh, from 11 to 23 kilograms. I'm not sure what's that in pounds. Um, in the unit that uh, a lot of people may use in the States. Um, and I, it's also a second smallest big cat, <laughs> kind of confusing, isn't it? Second smallest big cat in Asia. This is um, the size, second smallest big cat is after the Asian golden cat. So, um, 
these species found in South, Southern and Eastern Asia. So as you may see on the map here, um, these species are found from Indonesia to Nepal, uh, Borneo, Ind Indochina, Taiwan, and South China. The habitats that it likes, so this species likes to live in the dense forest, mainly tropical forest, dry forest, um, sometimes even in mangrove forest. And um, so there are two uh, uh, species of clouded leopards. One is called clouded leopard, so mainland clouded leopards, where you, you can see in the picture here on the top, that's the mainland clouded leopards. And the other one is the Sunda clouded leopard. So um, what are the differences between these? And on the map, you can see their range where they, where they, how they are divided. So for the um, Sunda clouded leopards, they are in Sumatra and in Borneo. So which would be that dark purple blue there. So, um, Sunda usually found in the lower elevations, range between 500 to 1,000 meters, and the mainland clouded leopards, you can uh, expect to see up to uh, 2,800 meters um, above sea level. I'm talking about the elevation right here. So, um, what makes these two, uh, so if you look at it, these two species um, are distinctive in the sense that um, the code markings, uh, the colors are a little bit different. So for the Sunda clouded leopards, the code markings, it's darker, but also they have a smaller and more uh, numerous markings, if you may. And um and it has for Sunda, it has longer canines than the the um, mainland clouded leopards. For Sunda, if you may if if you if you uh, may observe on this map uh, on the screen here, there are two um, islands. One is Sumatra and the other one is Borneo. So these had influence. So the scientists just um, define, they divided um, this species into two uh, subgroup, subspecies. Um, one is, is the species um, believed to be the in the, um, indigenous to uh, Sumatra, and the other one is exclusive to just Borneo. So what does this species spend um, its life doing amongst the leaves? So um, these, I'm just selecting just the cool facts related to this species. Um, this species, uh, like most wildcats, clouded leopards are solitary hunters. Um, they are nocturnal. And also in terms of the, uh, they are very they they are an ex they are excellent climbers um because they have strong legs and they specialize in uh, they um they have a very specialized foot pad and sharp re re retractable claws so what i find really um amazing is that they have also they they're rare um sorry they have a rotating rare ankle which enable them to safely descend or coming down from the trees head first just like squirrels um Apart from that, they also very uh, stealthy move. Uh, they have very stealthy movements and they have very good eyesight. In terms of their uh, diets, so they would, uh, 
their diets range from medium uh, medium to small size angulates and because of their arboreal nature so sometimes they would um prey on monkeys or macaques uh, and um their small prey would be also some squirrels and birds. So this one, I find this super uh, cool fact. Can everyone have a guess where this photo was taken? I'll give you one minute to just type that into the chat. Okay, so this, my backyard. <laughs> it's going to, know, of course. Um, yeah, interesting. NEPL. Okay, so, so this photo is the first ever photo of clouded leopard taken in the wild and it was taken in about 1995 by the camera trap and this was taken in the anamites of Nakainam Tern. So um, now that's the general and I, what I find interesting facts um, about clouded leopards. I, I don't have to go into all of the details because I think it, some of you may um, already know a lot about it, but then some of you can also have a read up on it, uh, which there's um, quite not a lot of information, but there's some information available also online. But I just pick and choose what is um I what, what I found the most interesting. So now to my journey, um so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about my story from the field, um, which I did um to, to do that, which I did to um in order to research or search for the clouded leopards and the interactions of the clouded leopards with other species. So the search began with um, me and my team started designing and doing the camera trapping um, to study clouded leopards behavior and distribution. In Laos, at, at the time we started uh, uh, in Namak Um In the picture, you would see me setting up camera traps. The camera traps for those who who don't know, or if you have already seen other talk, then forgive me. I'm just gonna explain it a little bit. So it's just the um, it's uh, use the sensor to sense the heat and the movement, and then it triggers. Um, to take the photos. So um, this, the map here you see in the middle are is the, the map of the protected area, the national park called Nam Ad Pulay. And the, the red boxes are my um, survey uh, grid and the dots are the locations where I put my camera traps. So, if your eyes are good enough, you may be able to count the number of locations of the camera traps that are put into each box, each box. So each box contains 80 locations and each location, our team put out two camera traps to be able to take the picture of uh, species that would go walk by the camera 
both sides. So this would allow us to identify individuals, particularly those species like uh, clouded leopards, tigers, and these those who have a unique market. And uh, through this journey, you know, it's never that easy. And those who have been in the field would share this um, experience with me. It all looks nice and great when you know you see it on the picture, but then through this experience, you face challenges with challenges with uh, terrain and the um, unpredictable weather. You would be eating rice and salted jerky for days and days and days. Sometimes you wake up and your floor is all flooded, and sometimes you have to be walking with in the water up to your chest level um so yeah so this is the life of um biologists or the field staff who are working in the field doing monitoring but also protecting of the forest however um there's a challenging side but there's also you know, there's a moment when you're in there and you wake up and you walk through this beautiful landscape. Yes, part of it's modified, but the feelings of being on top of the mountains and being able to 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 be in the forest, emerge yourself into nature, to me, it's priceless. I feel very um, privileged to be able to, to do so and still being able to come out and tell the story. So through this survey, through this study, through this search of the clouded leopards, the camera trapping data have given us a lot more than just photos. You can learn a lot about the species, their behavior, where they are, the distribution of the species. And I'm gonna show you what I found. And once you come out and you start seeing things like this, it does give, particularly me, a drop of encouragement, the love for the protected area, the love for the forest, the love for these animals. It just fill my heart with all this evidence that you see. So like I said, the camera traps then doesn't only give you just a nice photo. Like in these pictures, it shows you their interactions uh, with their mates, with, with their family, with also their prey. Like you see in this first, in, in the top right of the photo there is the clouded leopards trying to attack the porcupine, um, hoping that he would make that his dinner. But then I had um, a consec uh, another uh, um, consecutive photos uh, that show that the uh, porcupine won in this case. Apart from getting the data on clouded leopards, I also got to witness or got the data of the last two tigers at the time this was between 2013 to 2014 at the time i thought this could be the only two tigers left in the wild so the top two uh, pictures are a male and the bottom female and sadly enough um, we no longer, so this species is um, extirpated from the, from the national park before my eye as I was going through my um, PhD research. That aside, there are the other uh, data sets that I got. I got the data set on the Asian golden cats. And um, 
here you may observe on the left top on the top left of the picture there are sometimes both are Asian golden cats but sometimes they come in the uh, darker color and then there's these little cute marble cats this is one of also my favorites um uh, wild cat and they are still understudied because a lot of attentions of course going into studying bigger um cats and carnivores and yeah so this um it has very big tails it's also arboreal just um it it exhibits main arboreal nature so it stay up on the tree it has these big tails to help um balancing when it's up there and then there's another sibling um which is similar size to marble cats which is the leopard cats and this one is quite common and you would buy this in most areas and the top uh, picture there is priceless you get to see the mother and the young so yeah then i also got the data on other carnivores so you see this group of apac predators still exist in the in the protected area and there's some uh the bottom right is the black bear and the one standing up is the sun bear apart from that you get to see these protected areas still have fantastic prey based species so with the gawa and the baby oh sorry not the gawa sorry the cereal and the baby on the left uh, left uh, the top left and the samba on the top right then uh, there's a red moon jack there in the bottom right and the wild pig then there's this series of macaques and we get this um we call it a wild, um, wildlife selfie so the macaque selfie um it's it's really nice to see all of this um after coming out after going through all of that seeing this really gives me a boost then there are also um ground dwelling birds um, including silver pheasants, uh, grey peacock pheasant, uh, rufous throated partridge, and the red jungle fowl. But all of this, pic all of these beautiful pictures, um, only tells you one side of the story. That yes, it's very nice to see all these things coming in and, and still exist in the forest. But then there's another side of story that we also witness. And this is, these photos here, I hope there's no kids um, watching this. Um, these photos here show, these are poachers. So they're in there to, to poach, to hunt. Some hunt, hunt, wildlife for consumption, mostly the impact on the populations of wildlife or biodiversity are the poaching for illegal wildlife trade. So is there a future for clouded leopards or a clouded future? So to answer this we probably have to look at what is the status of the clouded leopard at the moment the population of the clouded leopards uh, we don't really have uh, the the actual estimates but we think we um, think it's probably roughly around three thousand to five thousand still left in the wild the population is still going to be uh, seems to be fragmented due to um, uh, some major threats so at the moment uh, the population 
is in decline. And uh, the main threat to the decline is due to loss, um, habitat loss due to deforestation and also poaching for trade. So the clouded leopards are uh, hunted mainly for their teeth, their bone. Sorry. Uh, their teeth, their bones, and their coats because um, their beautiful fur makes them desirable in the fashion industry leading to illegal poachings. So in addition, uh, their bones are also used in traditional Asian medicine. Uh, and this, because of this, this has further contributing to their um, vulnerability um, in their population. So what have we been doing in Laos in terms of uh, conservation efforts? Uh, some NGO, uh, international NGOs, have uh, suggest WWF, WCS, IUCN, and then um, some other organizations that still put in some efforts into conserving biodiversity in Laos. So these NGOs are working with partnership with the government and some CSOs and um, CSO counterparts to uh, conserve in general biodiversity, the habitat of wildlife that in turn benefiting clouded leopards. So the effort that this uh, INGO have put into conserving um, includes um, protected area management, which um, you would see for WCS, they would have um, they would work in um Nam Aprilay, um in Bolikamsai, Nam Kading um area. And um, for WWF, there are um pre priority sites, uh pre priority landscapes and um pre priority um protected areas, Sesap, Sepian, and Nampui. And also the work also integrate, integrating local communities into implementation. Um, we could not do without the local communities um, and local authorities. They play the major role in conservation. So we have to integrate them. We have to include them into the process and raising awareness about the uh, importance of biodiversity conservation. This is, these, these actions or efforts that I listed here, I'm just naming a few, but there are a lot more in details that all these organizations are working separately at their own sites, but in a way together to conserve biodiversity in Laos. So what can we do to conserve the clouded leopards and biodiversity overall? Um, not just in Laos, but in other areas. First of all, we need to be a voice for the clouded leopards and for biodiversity by supporting all these conservation organizations that are working towards um, conserving habitats and biodiversity and reduce at the personal level reduce our environmental footprints. And also, once you understand, spread the knowledge, encourage people around you, and um, in terms of the importance of, and teach them or explain to them the importance of the, the conservation work to um, the conserving the to the population of um, clouded leopards and other species by conserving them, we also saving our planet and providing benefits to our well-being. 
So this brings me to the end of my talk. Thank you, and I'm well. I I I welcome all of your questions. Over to you, Varen. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Achi San. Um, do you want to stop sharing your screen? Yeah. Please, or can you? That was absolutely wonderful. I learned so much more about the clouded leopards that I didn't know. So thank you very much. <laughs> um, now, I think we haven't got any questions, unanswered questions in the chat yet. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> excuse me. While we wait for those to come in, uh, I have a question for you. <clears throat> excuse me. Yeah. My throat. So we are at, at most a lot of people on the call here will know and, and you know it well as well. The Saula Foundation have been setting up a, a, a field team in the Annamite Mountains. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the challenges that we have faced is a very low rate of female applicants coming forward for field team positions, traditionally dominated by men. You and I both know this well. So do you have any advice for us as the Silo Foundation to help encourage Lao women to come forward for those for those roles? Yeah, so um, yeah, this is uh, quite a common challenge, right? To find, to have female joining the field teams. I mean, oftentimes I find myself the only one in the team in the forest with, um, 14 other men um, <laughs> in the forest together. And I I think this is because of the, the perception, but also part part of it is a cu cultural reason. Um, but then the perception of this work is, is for men to do, right? And I think the way to go about encouraging more females to participate in um, this field of work is already, I think you are already one step ahead, is to provide this stage or this platform for female researchers to, um, to showcase their work and to tell other people that, it, that it's possible to be doing this job and that there's no need to be scared of doing it. So I think by Saula Foundation having me on this talk and others, females on this talk, I think that's also send a positive message to younger generations and females to, yeah, to participate more and to feel um, comfort about comfortable, sorry, about joining this field of work. Thank you. Thanks. That's great feedback as well. Thank you so much. Um, so I've got a question. You've got a question here from Linda, Linda Taberbeck. How are you approaching the effort to educate people? First of all, I think we, as a person who is going, or as an organization who are going to be educating them, we need to understand um, about the importance of our work. Once you understand it, you live it, you act by example, that's one thing. Um, you teach by leading example, you, you walk the talk. And um, then I think it's a matter of seeking the platform to bring in these people who we find challenging and need um, um, a bit more uh, support in understanding it. Um, for me, when I see people, sometimes I have a conversation with some people and then you realize that, okay, they don't understand certain things regarding conservation, 
they sometimes say something that can, to a certain extent, uh, can be irritating to you. But then for me, I look at it as, okay, you have to feel, to feel compassion for them. You have to um, feel like they are saying it or standing in that position just because the, there's a lack of understanding. Great, thank you. Um, the message for you from Bob Dubias, who I believe he's left the call now, he says, thank you, excellent presentation. Yeah. Uh, he hopes to be in Laos next month as a new biodiversity advisor to the Monsoon Wind Project. Perhaps we can meet at that time. So there you go. I, I, I thought I should read that to you in case you didn't see it yourself. Um, so I have another question here. I'm going to skip ahead. I'll come back to Linda's question. So from... Jordan Binnen, apologies if I've mispronounced your name. Are there any financial benefits for the local communities from conservation efforts done at the moment? Right. So this, um, depending on the um, uh, conservation activity. So I, I'm going to give you the example of uh, Namad Fuller, which I also see Kamgao attending, he is uh, managing at the moment, Namad Pula here. So one of the uh, activities um, that Namad Pula is doing um, quite well is uh, um, ecotourism. So they have uh, a few packages on uh, for ecotourism. And this is, um, they received an award on um, responsible ecotourism where they engage the community. So part of the income is going to supporting the local communities, but then part would go and support the park. Um, yeah, so this is the model. So at the moment, so in terms of the financial, apart from the um, ecotourism, local communities, some of them are also participating in patrolling and also in, in uh, monitoring work. So they gain part of the incomes from participating in uh, implementing the protected area management in this way. Thank you. Um, another question from Linda. Do the protected areas have many rangers to patrol for poachers? No, that's a short question. We don't have a lot. This is um so this is this is uh I would say one of the main challenge uh in protection, protecting biodiversity in in, in Laos. A lot of this um this is the case because of um one is the the limited resources, patrolling activities can be quite um, financially consuming, <laughs> financially, yeah, in terms of re resource wise, also. But then uh, in Laos, we don't also have um, that many uh, official rangers. Very few, if you would, if you would count. But a lot of time we involved local communities and we have volunteers. So I think going forwards, this kind of work will have to go beyond um, just having the officials when this is the case in the country like Laos where um, limited personnel um, from, uh, from the government uh, still exist. Thank you. So a question from Kushal. Are Sunda and mainland clouded leopards genetically different or only separated by geographical features? Say again. Um, are, Sun are, are Sunda and mainland clouded leopards genetically different or is are they just geographically separated? They are genetically different. Thank you. Uh, another question from Linda. Um, 
and I have one to follow this up, actually, hold on, I'll start. Are poachers who are caught prosecuted with a significant enough penalty to show other poachers that it might not be worth the risk? No. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, this is another problem. So law enforcement, law, uh, weak law enforcement is still an issue. Um, oftentimes we don't, um, I mean, there are a lot of cases that didn't get uh, prosecuted and the bite is not large enough um, to discourage um, poachers. Um, so the question I have, thank you, apologies if you answered this and I missed it, but I noticed that one of the poacher, the picture is, the poacher was naked, he appeared to be naked. Yeah. Can you explain that? Um, yeah, that came as a surprise for 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 us also. Um, I think it was more sort of to show that what's the word like, like to put it in your face that mooning. I'm not scared. He was mooning the camera. Mooning. <laughs> yeah, it was an insult. Is that what you mean? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it was like an an insult, but also like to 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 send you a message that this, you know, I'm I'm here and I I'm not scared, huh. and uh, yeah, that's how I take it. <laughs> um. Okay. Uh. Follow up. Uh, so from Bill Allen, does the. the does the um the clouded leopard habitat overlap with saula habitat? Used to be. Uh, it used to be, yeah, in the Anamites um, mountain range, but now I'm um. Hang on, because I'm not sure, I mean, at, at the recent stage, because we're still going through our camera trap um, data, because we have uh, one protected area that is um, still um, recollecting the camera traps back. I don't remember from the top of my head um, yet, but yes, to answer in short, yes, it's overlapping the range, because the, the photos that I show you was taken in the animite. I'll just add one uh, one note out to you. So that that camera trap you showed of the first clouded leopard photograph ever in the wild. I was working for WCS when we set that camera in '95, and it was just a several hours walk from the village where the year before Bob Dobius, who was on this call, documented, confirmed for the first time the presence of Sala in Laos a couple of years after it was discovered in Vietnam by finding horns in a village just several hours walk from where we got that clouded leopard photo. <clears throat> okay, so I'm gonna ask one more question and then pass it over to Bill to wrap up. Um, so this is a question from Rick Passaro. How did you arrive at the figure of 3,000 to 4,000 population estimates? Is there sufficient data to support this and or have new techniques been developed to make more accurate estimates? So yeah, um, when you do population estimates, um, it it takes a, a lot of time and effort to do population estimates. I think we haven't done a proper population estimates because it's also resource like it, to get the accurate population estimates means you have to survey the entire range of the clouded existing range of the clouded leopards to start doing that so the number that i give you here it was just um like i see there's like some information um that was putting up also uh online where they Sometimes this kind of estimation, they do it based on if, um, let's say, if you get an estimate of the density per 100 square kilometer, you can multiply that by the suitable um, habitats of the clouded leopards to get the number of clouded leopards, which is if there's no other impact from 
anything. So that's like if you take out the threats, take out any effect, impacts from the external um, impact on the population. <clears throat> Thank you. Yeah, a similar problem exists for 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 all all wildlife species. Population estimates are are they're they're often educated guesstimates. <laughs> so, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Well, hand over to Bill. Thanks so much, Achu. That was really really wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Achu. That was fantastic. And I have a question. That photo of the Asiatic wild dogs, the doll, was that a pup in its mouth that it was carrying? Yes. So it was oh, carrying wow. a pup. <laughs> Across the river. <laughs> yeah. You got some incredible photographs and the clouded leopard, you know, testing out the porcupine and the little marbled cat. I mean, God, those are extraordinary. And I think that's a good summary of, you know, um, what we're doing is the Sawa Foundation for Animite Mountains Conservation. It's always more than about just Sawa. It's about conserving all these other amazingly beautiful animals that we saw in your presentation that also roam the Animite Mountains. So it's about the animals. Um, and I think it's all about people. Um, conservation is about working with people. The animals are fine if we leave them alone. Um, and you need good people to do that. And Akchu, you are certainly one example of that. Um, and also I wanna give out a shout to uh, last month's speaker, our scent detection dog leader, Vatsana Chandavong. She just came out of the forest with the two detection dogs and our technical leader, Rob Timmons, to the good news that she's been granted a scholarship by our partner, Asian Species, Species Action Partnership, to study conservation leadership. So this is fantastic. So I would invite you, the talk was free, but if you want to honor Ak Chu San and thank her for the talk, and if you want to give a little congratulations to Vatsana, please make a donation uh, to the Sao Law Foundation. We would really appreciate it. Um, you can either go on our line, um, just find the donate button. And you know, we're, we're really standing at a moment of conservation history. After three years of hard work, we have this incredible team together. Um, and there, the search is on now for Sao Law. As I said, they just came out of the forest after a couple of weeks there searching for Sao Law. This is the time to hit it. We're at a moment in history for wildlife conservation, and we would be so grateful for your support to take advantage of this and make this successful. So with that, I'll thank Akju again, and thank you all for, for joining us today. And please do sign up for our newsletter, as Lorraine said, if you wanna keep tabs and follow this incredible search for Saula. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.